for coming. Um, my name is Rachel Laka. I'm a junior at Minton. Um I'm going to be a moderator. I'm Michael Beckwith. I will also be a moderator. I'm also a junior here. So um, we're just going to hand the mic to the speakers so they can introduce themselves, just their name and um, their field of study. Hello everybody, my name is Cameron Hollingshead. I study mathematics here. I'm an undergraduate student. Hi, I'm Blake Wilson. I'm a graduate student in the philosophy department. Good evening, my name is Chris Taylor. I am a graduated student from a long time ago here at Binghamton University. Um, I teach uh, high school IP physics and I adjunct uh, astronomy here at Binghamton University. Hello, my name is Nicholas Gaidash, and uh, uh, I am uh, faculty, I, I am a, a science educator at the Kerner Observatory, and um, my background is in uh, electrical engineering. I was a computer engineer for IBM, and I was a faculty member at, at the computer science department here at Binghamton University, and I'm retired from that. I have no Thank you, Rachel. So, I find the phrasing of the question rather interesting. You, you use the word should. Uh, I find that a very troublesome word. So, um, in my analysis of your question, I was wondering, why not have both of those? Like, why not be curious about what exploring space can do for us? So if you meant should, as in um, will be best outside the realm of self-interest, uh, that is something like um, financial or militaristic gain, then yeah, I suppose we would opt for the sake of curiosity because space is a very interesting place. Um, in the status of the world, um, pulling money into space exploration uh, it can only be supported by curiosity for a terminal amount of money, so um, I think self-interest is a very powerful motivator, even if it does have a very bad reputation. Uh, and as for just doing research on extraterrestrial materials, um, not even just beings, uh, I, I think it could be very fascinating, especially if you do take an interest in the topic. Uh, I'm not sure if everyone does take an interest, and in order to uh, be able to explore space in the current state of the world, I think uh, some exploration would need to provide evidence that there would be um, something for the human population to gain from uh, space exploration, not just like the sake of knowledge, but actual materials, minerals, like maybe a cure for AIDS or something, I don't know, whatever might be out there. All right. I think Cameron's right. Um, when we talk about the word should, uh, should can really mean two different things. So if um, my student Anthony, who I saw out there somewhere, called me up and said, hey Blake, my motorcycle is broken, what should I do? There's a series of steps that I could walk him through to tell him how to go about fixing his motorcycle. But as philosophers, philosophers are more interested in the word should in terms of what sort of things are we morally obligated to do. 
So if the question is, what uh, should we explore space to see what it can do for us, or should we explore space simply for curiosity, I don't think that there's any moral obligation that we do either of those. So the next step would be asking, well, what sorts of things would space exploration actually make life better on Earth? Would it improve uh, people's uh, level of health? Would it improve our knowledge of ourselves and therefore the knowledge of the world? So those are the types of questions that we would probably want to be asking ourselves before we engage uh, in the practice. Um, in terms of curiosity, I think we can look back five or six hundred years and see what European curiosity uh, entailed um, when explorers came from the old world to the new. Uh, it's very difficult to say that that type of exploration was an exploration that was predicated on simply looking at what is out there. So when uh, beings like us leave their home and travel to another part of either the world or the uh, atmosphere, I think we should be very uh, cautious and very critical about what the motivations and the reasons are for them. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I can reiterate uh, many, many of those same sentiments. Um, as a scientist, um, when I read the question, should we explore for the for, for what for space to see what it could do for us, that 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 at all doesn't sound what, to me like what we should be doing. Uh, curiosity and and discovery for me are much more uh, important. So, I was thinking about this question as, um, you know. Why, why wouldn't we explore space, um, even if we don't, or, or look for uh, alternate places to live, even if we don't gain uh, any any feasible advantages to the human race, why not see what else is out there? That, so, you know, when I read the question, I was thinking, you know, this 2001 a Space Odyssey, why, why wouldn't you want to try to explore space? Um, of course, I think along the way, there would, there would definitely be some uh, pros and cons. Uh, there would definitely be some some benefits and also some setbacks about that process of doing exploration. Um, who knows what will happen, but, but the should part of it, in my mind, if we're going to explore purely for scientific discovery, I think we absolutely should. Uh, thank you. Uh, human nature, uh, being what it is, I think we uh, would have both of those uh, motivations there. Uh, I'm surprised. I worked with NASA. I'm a NASA Earth Ambassador, and I made a lot of trips to Goddard, and uh, learned a lot about their motives and their whatever, and uh, why they do what they're doing. And I think that it's amazing that NASA has a strong uh, motivation in the area of uh, curiosity and discovery. Although always behind the scenes, there is that wanting to get the uh, practical side of it out, uh, because Congress, in the end, will ask, uh, "What are we getting back for our money?" knowledge or are we getting back uh, uh, some new material or some new uh, vehicle or something like that that could be to help us and help technology. Um, one thing that hadn't been mentioned here is uh, there's always a, a danger that the Earth could be impacted by a comet or an asteroid and our developing a spacecraft that you go out there, land on asteroids, land on comets, we've done those already, uh, gives us the technology that we need, possibly to divert an asteroid or comet from hitting the Earth. And these seem like far out things, but it's happened in the Earth's history already. And it could happen again. And we had some close calls, like uh, um, in twice in Russia. And um, let's see. Uh, So I, I think that uh, there's got to be a balance between the two and a combination. I do can get too, a little bit concerned about uh, too big of an emphasis on uh, the practical side of it, but wanting to see what uh, space exploration can do for us. Because if we look historically, when we ex when, uh, especially uh, in the exploration of the new world, uh, we saw exploitations of uh, uh, more primitive cultures than came out of Europe. And uh, time's up. <laughs> okay, thank you. Time was up. Okay, so this is the 90 second round where you guys can discuss amongst yourselves. Um, comment on the
90 seconds to comment so much or so. Okay. One thing I was wondering about um, <clears throat> were the astronomers of previous times and how a lot of them were able to make those huge discoveries. I, I, I couldn't connect to the internet in time to do my own little research, but I, if any of you know the answer, I am curious uh, how they got the funding to make those huge discoveries because I think that could be a, a, an important answer to this question as to figure out, oh, there's the internet now. Um, as to whether or not uh, we should be doing it for the sake of doing something for ourselves or for the sake of curiosity and discovery. Well, I think uh, when Chris said, why wouldn't we explore space, um, clearly there's budgetary things or considerations to make about this, about how much would it cost. Um, I haven't done the research to know what kind of money gets laid out for NASA. Um, and if we were faced with a choice between spending that money on a hospital, colleges, and so forth, uh, that would certainly be something to take into consideration. So that might be a reason why we wouldn't want to spend that money on shooting rockets up in the space. I, I don't disagree. I wasn't thinking monetarily, I guess, when I had said that. But as a scientist, I'm curious. And, and of course, if we're going to put together a budget, we, we have to make those tough decisions, you know. That, that, I agree 100 percent for sure. Um, but solely, um, should we, I was thinking of the question: Should we explore space for what it can do for us versus curiosity and discovery? Based on that, that focused question, I, I made that decision that why would we? But absolutely, I agree 100 percent with that. We would have to we'd have to pick our, our our monetary spending wisely. I think the, uh, in terms of money, the amount of money that NASA spends on a mission, you're talking about uh, uh, somewhere in under a hundred, hundreds of millions of dollars. If you look at what the rest, what is spent in our government on other things, some of it squandered, this is like nothing. And I think that it, the amount of uh, benefit that we get back intellectually and other practical benefits is uh, well worth it. And uh, I should just like to mention that the this whole, this whole topic for tonight is on the search for life. And uh, that is a primary force, a curiosity force, behind many, many of the NASA missions. The rovers that are on Mars and the Cassini mission that, is orbiting, that has been at, at uh, Saturn for a long time already and has discovered the potential, at least, of life on the moons of Saturn underneath the icy crust of those uh, subterranean seas. So that is a really strong uh, motivation for NASA. <laughs> That's okay. Second question. Uh, now, given what we've said about the different considerations about exploring space, including the monetary uh, considerations, do you think should we colonize other planets? And if so, how do we settle individual and sovereign rights to property and territory? given uh, what we may find on other planets in terms of minerals, resources, arable and livable land, as well as other life forms. I was wondering um, what would be the first step of learning about extraterrestrial life. And reading that question, uh, I was thinking, it depends on what you mean by colonize. If it just simply means inhabit for um, an indefinite amount of time, I would say yes, we should absolutely colonize other planets. Uh, since Earth is the only naturally habitable planet in our solar system, uh, it's not like we'll be just residing there. I, I can't imagine it being at the extent of science fiction like Total Recall, uh, where we just like have like a big space station there. But nevertheless, um, I still feel that we should colonize other planets in order to harvest whatever minerals or, or life that we can. Um, as for how about we go about doing that, how we settle those rights, uh, I imagine that we uh, work with the United Nations and the International Space Station program in order to um, facilitate and take full control over any further space explorations. Uh, and 
if we are concerned about harvesting materials, we could try to work with um, particular businesses. Uh, this is not a field of expertise for me, but it's it seemed like a nice notion uh, in my mind. Um, and so long as uh, the International Space Station program has full watch over any uh, further uh, examinations of other planets, I think it could be an, a decent program at the very least. I don't know if you can use the word colonize in a positive way. Um, certainly, again, what we've already made a couple comments about, I think when human beings colonize other areas, <laughs> We can look at history to see what human beings do when they colonize. I don't know if there's a nice way to colonize other areas, and particularly other beings. So immediately when the question was posed to us before, uh, prior to coming here tonight, that's the first thing that stuck in my mind, is that colonizing, I think, is bad. So immediately the question, should we colonize? No, we should not be colonizing these other areas. Um, and another way to look at it is, what would such a colony look like? And number two, backing up a little bit from that question, why not colonize the bottom of the, the ocean, right? There's a lot of places where we could theoretically stick people, but it doesn't mean that there needs to be anything close to colonization of those places. So looking also at some of the other legal issues, or the, the issues about sovereignty over these other places, when you colonize, that's exactly what you're doing. So colonization means that you're claiming some type of sovereignty, power, or control over these other spaces, whether again it's the bottom of the ocean, or the moon, or some other planet, or some part of the solar system. So there's already treaties that control the bottom of the ocean. There's treaties that govern a place like Antarctica, which has no government. Uh, no, uh, there's no uh, specific sovereign power that controls life in Antarctica. Uh, but there is, in fact, an outer space treaty. So illustrious nations like the US and Russia have signed it, but also nations that probably don't have a whole lot of power when it comes to sovereign claims over uh, the, uh, the atmosphere. Uh, but as it stands, all na many nations have signed a treaty that says we can't make any sovereign claims about parts of the atmosphere or planet. So there's already kind of an agreement between nations that they will not, in fact, make the kind of claims uh, that would be made by colonizers. So I'm opposed to colonizing space. Well. <clears throat> When I think of a colony, my initial thought is um, to, to have a displaced uh, culture, or whether, whether purposely or, or by um, uh, emigration. When, when I was thinking about the, the question, uh, the, our early colonization of North America was a colonization of Europeans into a region where there was already pre-existing life, not only intelligent but also unintelligent life, and it brought with it lots of problems um, for a number of reasons. One was disease, uh, two, um, the Indian, the Native American population was, um, you know, they, they were established culture and we were imposing our views and our customs, uh, when I say our, I mean Europeans, um, uh, upon that culture and, and that created problems. So I don't know if necessarily the process of forming a colony in the first place was necessarily an issue, because I think of that as, as being displaced, but the post-colonization um, issues that arose of the, you know, through that whole process was, was certainly dramatic. Um, however, if we were able to colonize, for example, a, a hypothetical planet, thank you, a hypothetical planet that had no pre-existing uh, life that we are aware of, however, was a habitable planet, I think we'd have to work out some logistical issues of who gets what rights and how do we do it. And I think we have a question coming up later about how do we decide who gets what rights to, to, to property. But um, I think if there's no pre-existing culture and there's certainly a benefit for colonizing that, that planet, maybe we should at least give it a attempt. Um, maybe we should come up with a different word. Yeah. Yeah, maybe, maybe we'd agree to come up with a different, a different phrase. But nonetheless, if there's a pre-existing culture uh, we have to, I think, really take into account what other customs do our research and, and not make the same mistake twice. I mean, 
15 seconds, thank you. There's been many, many colonization attempts throughout human history of one culture imposing onto other cultures in, in most problems. So we really should think hard about trying to colonize a habitable planet that has life already. Uh, when I looked at the question, <clears throat> Uh, they, it, it mentions sovereign rights. That sort of implies intelligent life. I mean, I don't know about the sovereign rights. Maybe there is such a thing of a, a bacterium or something like that. But uh, I think that the possibility of finding intelligent life that we could colonize in any reasonable length of time into the future is very low. And we, we, we may very well find other types of life, lower life, in the solar system here, in, in, in particular the icy moons of, uh, of Saturn and Jupiter. Uh, I've sort of uh, had the same thoughts that uh, I believe that Greg, you had it, you're Greg, right? Oh, Blake. Oh, I'm sorry. Greg's on there. Okay, Greg, okay, it's, it's, it's Blake. Uh, anyway, about um, uh, uh, colonization and um, and I think there have got to be treaties that say that there's no one country could own land on the moon or on Mars or anything like that. Maybe they're there already. Uh, uh, and also, if we do, for some reason, run into intelligent life somehow, maybe we'll find it here on Earth, not us, but aliens coming here. One minute, okay. Uh, we've got to be careful we don't repeat history. Uh, when Europeans came, as I mentioned already, came to the North and South America, the high-tech cultures won out, and the low-tech cultures, the Native Americans, who were primitive cultures, lost out. And but that should never occur again. We should be very conscious of that. Just before I came here, I, re I uh, reviewed snippets of uh, District 9, I think. I'm, has very many people here seen that movie? Uh, it really got me thinking about it. Uh, uh, I mean, there were these aliens, they uh, were sort of uh, unusual looking, but they were treated very badly. And I think we've got to be very conscious of this. Uh, one other thing we've got to do in the last couple of seconds here is uh, if we're going to colonize, we've got to be careful that we don't contaminate the planet if we're looking for life. And also, when we get there, we don't pick up um, organisms that could affect us and uh, we will have no immunity to it. And uh, this reminded me of the Martian that I saw just recently. Uh, they certainly contaminated Mars with that garden that they had, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the astronaut that was left there. And, uh, and once you contaminate the planet, you'll never know again how unique life is that doesn't belong to Earth. I'm sorry. Lightning round, right? Or, or just responses or whatever? Yeah. Okay, right. All right, so. Oh. I misunderstood. So many of you mentioned um, the European colonization of the New World uh, in the 15th and 16th centuries. Is there anything you think that we can do uh, preemptively to avoid repeating history of, your, of the European colonization? Given how you all mentioned the uh, European colonization of the New World in the 16th and 17th centuries, do you think there's anything we could do preemptively to avoid repeating that history? I'm not sure how to feel about the question because uh, I, I think we first have to determine where pre-existing cultures exist. Uh, it depends on the type of life, and I guess it goes into the question you'll ask later about um, what, how do we define intelligent life, um, because even if life does exist on a certain planet, and if, even if we're concerned about um, contaminating uh, this, uh, whatever life might exist, uh, are, we, are we concerned about tarnishing the culture of the bacteria, or are we, are we still talking about um, like anthropomorphic beings. Um, other than that, uh, I th I'm thinking back to the colonization of the Americas, I, I would like to think that in the long run it was a positive thing because 
uh, even though, yes, of course, we, uh, in light of it being Thanksgiving time, we, we slaughtered the heck out of the Native Americans. Um, I think stationing ourselves in that area has actually done a lot of good, uh, and we were actually able to expand ourselves as a culture further. So perhaps the tarnishing of one culture helped the growth of another, and that might be the way of how we extend ourselves beyond planet Earth. Um, I think what Chris said earlier about uh, there's got to be a difference here between landing on some planet and there's a race or whatever the word would be, there's a group of some type of sentient being there and there not being a group of sentient beings there. So one way you can avoid the errors, uh, their errors, I think they're errors, the errors of European colonization is to colonize a planet where there is no culture or something like a culture that is being colonized upon. So I think that was a great point to make. Um, another way to avoid making those types of mistakes, I think, would be setting a clear colonization or exploration is going to occur. There's got to be some way to set an agenda to ensure that there is not exploitation, all the other bad things that we have seen from European colonization. One more thing to think about. If an alien spaceship were to land here in the middle of the room tonight, and we were to say to ourselves, why are these beings here? They're probably here to do the same types of things that human beings would be doing going from Europe to the New World, or going from Earth to another planet. So they are probably here because we look really tasty. So that is something to keep in mind. Yeah, thank you. Um, not to make a joke, uh, but I'm a Star Wars and a Star Trek fan, so. Um, I was thinking about the Prime Directive, if you're not a Star Trek fan, you don't know what that means, but uh, the Prime Directive says, you know, observe, um, don't interfere, make observations, uh, collect your scientific data. If, if a civilization already exists, don't interfere. And so my point earlier was, you know, if we're going to explore space to, to not only gather natural resources, but also to settle, then I, I, I have to think the numbers suggest there will be enough habitable planets that we can find a habitable planet or two or 10 or 50 that doesn't have intelligent life, or even microbial life yet, uh, yet is in the habitable zone, if it's a fairly young system. Um, on the other hand, the Star Wars people out there would say, well, Darth Vader would just attack and take over, you know. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. You know, that's what they did in the US. No, seriously, I, I think, um, I think, sorry, I had to get a Star Wars joke in. New, new movies coming out soon. Um, but no, on a serious note, though, I think, I think the model of, of making observations, really doing our homework, not interfering in the culture or with a system, whether it has life or not, until we've done our homework entirely and then agreeing to not colonize a uh, uh, planet that has any sort of um, prerequisite that would, that would eliminate us from going there. For example, life or intelligent life or inappropriate um, resources to make it worthwhile. That's fine. Uh, like I said, I think the uh, likelihood of finding uh, intelligent life that you would colonize, I guess, I mean, that you would uh, exploit, let's put it that way, is very low in, in our solar system. Maybe there's things like this around some uh, other stars. But uh, I think uh, what we got to think about is uh, exploitation and interference among ourselves. Uh, a lot of the battles and uh, bad feelings and everything that came out of colonization in our history came from <coughs> countries, one country against another, England and Spain. And, and uh, the same thing could happen. I mean, the Russians uh, are working relatively independently of us in exploring space. And what if they decide that they're going to uh, colonize, and we want to colonize? And what if there's a monetary or a, a 
technological advantage to doing this. There could be competition between these countries. So I think that's something to be considered. And uh, the other thing is that colonization may be a necessity someday if we mess up the earth bad enough through uh, pollution or, uh, God forbid, the sun starts dying. It will die someday. That's a long-term type of thing, and that would mean wanting to colonize for survival purposes. Thank you. Can I, can I respond? Yeah, yeah. yeah sure. Um, so one of the things I was talking about in my astronomy class a couple weeks ago is that the sun will expand into a red giant in, in, in its near future, and even before it does that, about a billion years from now, it's going to grow enough in, in size, the luminosity is going to become high enough that the Earth's atmosphere is going to be unsustainable at its current condition. So, a billion years is a long time. Um, no intelligent, or I'm sorry, no, uh, uh, well, let me correct what I said. I'm not a biologist. Most um, uh, organ, or uh, what's the right word? Biology people help me out. Um, the, 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 the advanced organisms, or um, complex organisms, that's the word I'm thinking of. They, most of them don't tend to stick around for many, many millions or even billions of years. Usually it's simple cell um, organisms that survive that long. So even if we are around a billion years, I'd like to think that, that we would make the argument that we would want to try to have an, an alternate place in our universe to, to have gone as a species. Um, it's going to take a lot of work and a lot of effort, and fortunately we have a lot of time before the sun does expand, but you never know. Uh, Chris mentioned about the sun expanding and going into a, a red giant, and that's something that probably we don't worry about not we sleep well tonight. It's not going to happen. Yeah, in five billion years. But there is something that could be maybe not as dramatic as that, and that's climate change. They're talking about right now, if we don't control the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, uh, the temperature of the Earth is going to start rising, and it could get to some point where colonization and moving out to a, a planet further out, maybe Mars, might be a reasonable thing to think about. There's even talk about moving the planet's orbit. You know, with, I, don't, I don't know if I buy it, but maybe. We'll see. Well, the question now comes up about the human race turning itself into a, like a refugee race, meaning we're leaving this planet because we have done something horrible to it or something horrible has been done to it beyond our control. <coughs> which therefore necessitates us leaving, which brings us into a, a whole new discussion. So um, we started talking about, should we colonize? And well, yeah, that's oh, the joy of exploration. And now we're entertaining the idea that we're burning the planet up. And in order to preserve the human race, uh, we need to go set up a colony or whatever you would call the, the structures and buildings that were in the Martian, which is a movie that a lot of us have seen. Certainly what uh, the structures that the uh, astronauts or explorers were in in the Martian was certainly not a colony. It was a, a single structure on that planet that I think was designed to do a little more than uh, gather information, but certainly not to colonize. Um, if during our lifetimes we're in a position where we become environmental refugees from our own planet, um, Obviously, there's going to be no provision for colonizing and saving the Earth and that, that, in, if that sort of thing were to occur. I don't have much to add to that other than I find that to be a very interesting scenario where if we were to leave Earth, then no longer are we um, the supreme beings. Uh, now we're, we're the people looking for help from other places. Uh, I'm not sure to what uh, extent we can reach out into space and find a place that's habitable, but um, like if we have the technology to do that, I'm, I'm, man, that scenario would be um, quite the story to tell for the human race, especially if there is an indeed life more intelligent than us, or at least more prepared for life just to like show up out of the blue. Cameron brought up the question of whether these beings that we're discussing about um, kind of how or that we're talking about colonizing them, um, do they need to be anthropomorphic to be intelligent life? Are they microbial? 
Um, and I think Dr. Gadosh also touched upon the question. So the next question, the third question is, how should we define intelligent life and how should we go about, uh, go about interacting with it? Well, Gaidash initially, I think it was Gaidash who mentioned uh, simple and complex organisms, or what? Uh, Chris Taylor, yeah. Um, so, if intelligence is it defined by um, some sort of um, brain, then uh, I guess that's what would count as intelligent life, and you can differentiate that from. Uh, microbial, but it depends on how you view the nucleus. Um, beyond that, though, um, like however we might define intelligent life, in terms of how we interact with it, uh, I suppose you could treat it like how we would treat any of uh, the species that we might find on our planet, uh, except we have to consider that uh, if, we're, say, we were to discover something in a place like Mars, uh, the life that we might find there is having relatively extreme conditions. And even on Earth, there have been cases of uh, a species uh, under extreme condition and still surviving. And despite what most uh, bacteria can do, um, so how we interact with it? Um, yeah, I would, I would say just like take the same precautions you would take with species on Earth. with. Um, the factors of making sure that uh, your own bacteria doesn't spread throughout uh, the planet because that, that is a huge risk. I mean, even an astronaut's breath can uh, spread a lot of bacteria if uh, they're not taking the right precautions on other planets or, or moons or, and whatnot. Well, I think clearly uh, when we encounter other beings, um, Certainly here on Earth, there's a difference between a microbe or a germ or a virus, <clears throat> and then uh, lower level animals, uh, frogs and snakes, moving up to mammals, and then moving up to people. Excuse me. <laughs> so um, one of the probably primary concerns that we're going to have about these beings that we encounter is, are they able to feel in some certain way? Meaning, are they able to experience emotions or experience pain? So when we look at how we treat something as different as a tree or your dog, we know that your dog, if you stick a pin or you kick your dog, your dog hurts. So that probably doesn't happen with the tree. So starting at that level, uh, if we encounter beings that are able to reciprocate in a way that we associate with feeling pain, it means that there's probably a right or wrong way to treat these beings. Moving up to that next step, that next step would probably be the ability of that being to engage in some type of, of reason. Uh, and the reason would be, would reflect its ability to take in information from its environment, its ability to engage in abstract thinking, like you might do in a logic or a methods of reasoning course, its ability to choose from uh, different possible outcomes, its ability to explain its rationale for its behavior. Um, and then the next move up from that, so we go from feeling, reasoning, to some type of intelligence, I think computers probably have a certain amount of intelligence, but backing up, they're not able to engage, or not able to feel a, a subconscious um, or subjective feeling of pain, and they probably don't engage in the type of reasoning <clears throat> that the rest of us engage in. So if we've got purely an intelligent being on this other planet that we encounter that doesn't feel a reason, it may not uh, demand the same sort of treatment that a being that is able to reason and feel demands. And again, a being that is only able to feel but not reason probably doesn't deserve uh, the same type of uh, treatment either. And we can look at that in the way that we treat other human beings and moving down to apes and mammals and so forth. Yeah, I could, I could I'm going to keep mine shorter because um, I basically could uh, reiterate a lot of the same sentiments. Uh, what I was thinking was, is we, we have to come up with some sort of uh, criterion for what is intelligence and initially what came to mind to me was is uh, communication if we can communicate then that involved that uh, suggests that there's some sort of 
processing of receiving information, processing that information, and making a response. Um, what form that intelligent that that life form will take it could be any number of of, of forms. Uh, doesn't necessarily have to be anthropomorphical. What's that word? The anthropomorphical. Thank you. Um, I don't speak big words very well. Uh, anyway, um, no, but I, I think that intelligence or that uh, species cannot communicate effectively with us. My personal feeling would be leave them alone um, and don't get involved at all. That would be my my cutoff. Uh, I uh, agree with uh, Chris on uh, the communication part of it. I think that uh, being communicative is a necessary condition, but not a sufficient condition. I mean, we could communicate with our pets, too. I mean, uh, there's a certain amount of language that goes back and forth between uh, we and animals that we might have. I think the use of tools, is a, a, even though it's not a the UFO or flying saucer, if we went to another planet and saw that there was a heavy use of tools, it's a sign of uh, intelligence. You see it in apes here. And uh, so there's, a, there's not a big quantum jump as you go from species to species. It's a, it's a gradual increase in intelligence as you go up the uh, tree of life. So we, hopefully we're at the top of it. Um, as far as a, a comment made by Blake, I got it right this time, didn't I? Uh, I, I don't know about emotions. Uh, I don't think I would like to, I think that's being a bit anthropomorphic. Um, I don't see where mo mo emotions or even morals or anything like that could be uh, imprinted on or expected from alien beings. Those are models that we get from our own uh, human race living here on Earth. And, uh, and I think we've got to be careful on that. Uh, I remember the old time movie, uh, To Serve Man. Uh, I mean, there was no morals there, yet we thought there was. We thought they were very friendly, but uh, yet uh, they came here for dinner. <laughs> and, um, there's, um, and so, so I just think that we have to be uh, very careful in uh, our definition of life. And I think, I think defining life itself has been pretty much nailed down by biologists. But when we get to int uh, intelligent life, it's very, very, very subjective. And uh, we've got to be careful that when we do find what may be intelligent life, we may, it isn't discovering intelligent life, it's not knowing it's there. Uh, we could uh, go to some other planet and discover creatures living there and think that they're a lower form of life and they're not. I mean, and I think that's the other side of the coin that we've got to be careful about. And uh, I think, am I out of time? Oh yeah, one other thing I wanted to mention. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Drake's equation. It's a, it's a little mathematical formula that Frank Drake came up with that uh, how, to be able to determine if any signals coming from space are from an intelligent source. And I think that implies the necessary condition of uh, communication. Uh, and it's, it's fooled us a number of times because there's a lot of natural things that could emulate uh, what looks like maybe uh, intelligent signals coming from space. But uh, that is the one thing that I think everybody agrees upon. If you do see that it's a sufficient condition, if you do see communication, I mean a necessary condition, you could be pretty uh, uh, not certain, but have, have a, be confident that what we're dealing with is uh, intelligent life. And maybe we shouldn't even attribute it to life. I mean, could there be robotic life out there, robotic uh, beings out there that, that could emulate uh, uh, not humans, but uh, intelligent beings, too. Thank you. Well, I got to disagree because I think that um, the emotional content or the emotional inner life of whatever these beings are is important. Because the being from To Serve Man, the Twilight Zone episode, was almost like a big ant. You know, it was like an insect. So all that insect was doing was gathering together food, which was us. If you haven't seen it, it's on YouTube. It's a great Twilight Zone episode to serve man. It's a cookbook, right? It's the clincher from them. So the idea would be if you've got an alien race that are just big insects, like the machines that came down and harvested humans in to War of the Worlds, we're in trouble. And we do not want to be on that planet. 
So in terms of the emotions and in terms of the ability to, let's say, feel some type of pain or have some sort of interior emotional life, well, that's how we relate to our pets. That's what makes the difference between a pet ant, which has no emotional life and probably has no ability to feel pain, I'm not sure. Um, that's the difference between the ant and the dog and other people. That what's important about that pet dog is there's something going on in the animal Think. I'm not sure, but there's something going on in the animal that is similar to our own feelings of joy when we see our loved one or even when we see the dog. So when the dog is excited and we get home and we're excited too, well, there's something that's happening inside the animal that we can relate to. And if there's nothing of the type that's happening in that other animal, then it's, it's, it's almost as if it's moved down, uh, it's moved down a step in the level of treatment that it receives back uh, from us. So I think that the emotions are, uh, are important. I'm wondering if empathy is something that developed over time on Earth because uh, suppose that uh, intelligence life stemmed from like one single being and then like it stemmed off into something where um, a species just did not develop those empathetic skills, and even though we would classify them on Earth as something um, sociopathic, on another planet that's just completely normal. Um, and so, I, I'm not I'm not exactly taking a side here, but uh, I, I I think it is possible that uh, there are species that don't have those empathetic skills, and thus, um, if they are truly intelligent life and uh, have things in mind, not necessarily just dominating our planet, but um, like they may not be communicating for purely logical reasons. Uh, you met, uh, Gaidosh mentioned uh, Drake's equation, and I thought, oh, what about the Fermi paradox? The fact that even though there is that high probability of their uh, existing life outside of Earth, we still haven't really communicated with anything. Um, and. And I was wondering, hmm, has there just been like a lack of communication where no one can communicate, or is there a life that chooses not to? Um, so how we interact with that life, I'm not sure if there's anything we can do, but like nothing in our control right now, um, but I'm curious if it's in control of something else. I feel like I'm setting up some science fiction horror story, so I'll just pass the mic down. Yeah, yeah, nothing to say at this point. Okay. <laughs> well, I just wanted to elaborate on what Cameron was saying. The, the, the Drake equation is a series of, of um, guesses, ed educated guesses, and it kind of goes kind of something like this. Um, if you uh, estimate the number of, of stars that could have habitable, pla habitable planets, that's one term. And then of those number of stars that have habitable, habitable planets, uh, how many of those planets are in the habitable zone? and so on and so forth. And, and ultimately what you do is you have a series of about five or six terms that, um, that you can multiply together. There's estimates of what the optimist would say and estimates of what the pessimist would say. Uh, so you have a range of terms, but ultimately none of those terms have a zero value. Even the pessimist would have to agree, you have to agree that there, there's a chance or a, even if it's a small probability of one of those terms being a number. You multiply them all together, so it's multiplication, it's six or seven terms multiplied together, you're going to get a number that's greater than zero. And so we know at least one intelligent species in our galaxy, and that's us. And the, um, the, the Drake equation suggests, even for the pessimist, that there's at least ten intelligent civilizations in our Milky Way. And Cameron mentioned the Fermi paradox, and the, the idea behind that is that even if there is other intelligent species out there, there's three parts to it. One, we've sent out signals or, or they've sent out signals and they're just too far away for us to receive or them to receive our me messages. Two, they heard us and they didn't bother to respond. Or three, that there is no other intelligent life out there. And so I think the Drake equation kind of kind of suggests that the third part of the Fermi paradox is that it doesn't hold true and it brings back, you know, full, full circle. If there is intelligence, 
are they thinking about on their end what defines intelligence and maybe we're not meeting their qualifications. We'll see. You look at human history, if they have the ability to look at what we've done or what we're doing on our planet, maybe they want to say, we're not going to get involved with that species. I, I don't know. Uh, it's you know something that I think about, though. Yeah. Um, about the uh, Fermi uh, paradox, uh, I don't really get too excited about the fact that we've uh, never really conclusively uh, made contact with an alien life form. Uh, the universe seems to be built to make that very difficult. The size of the our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, is uh, orders of uh, 50,000 light years or more. And maybe the nearest stars that seem to have a reasonable uh, chance of having life, and maybe intelligent life, are in the orders of uh, hundreds of light years away. And maybe further out in our galaxy. And forget about any life forms on distant galaxies. I mean, you're talking about millions of light years. And so somehow we're built into a vacuum that makes communication extremely difficult, unless somebody comes up with some other way of communicating rather than uh, radio waves. So you're talking about faster than light communication? Yeah, yeah. we'll see. So, uh, pizza time, maybe? Yeah. Very well, 15, 20 minutes. Whoa! Whoa.